regardless how much pain we're in in the moment, we have the same choice to do behaviorally what we want to be about. You're listening to Dr. Abigail Lev on Psychologists Off the Clock. Curious what psychologists chat about over coffee? We are three clinical psychologists and busy parents who love to talk about and explore the best ideas from psychology to use in our clinical work and in our own lives. I am Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California, where I specialize in compassionate, values-based approaches to living well. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, where I specialize in rehab and health psychology and acceptance and commitment therapy. And from coast to coast, I am Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University, specializing in evidence-based therapy for relationships. In this podcast, we explore how psychological principles can help improve your work, relationships, parenting, and health. We discuss the practices we use in the therapy room and bring you ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your own life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. I'm so glad we're here together, Debbie and Diana, to introduce an episode on the topic of how we can behave in ways that are more in line with our values, even in relationships where we experience frustration or even deep pain. I spoke with psychologist and author Abigail Lev about this topic on which she is an expert and has written a few books, and I think our discussion of how challenging it is to behave according to our values in relationships, especially relationships that bring up a lot of pain, is a topic that all three of us could relate to both personally and professionally. Yes, you discuss with her some ideas from schema therapy. And I really wasn't familiar with this concept of, I didn't know anything about schema therapy and I didn't, I wasn't familiar with this, this concept of schemas and how we really all come into relationships with early experiences that contribute to our expectations and these sort of interpersonal stories that we have scripts that we have that just play out over and over and over again. And that really affect us. And I thought that was such an interesting idea. And when I learned about it through your episode, I could see it everywhere around me and I could really relate to it from just my own life and my own relationships. It was really helpful for me clinically to, for this episode to show up right now. I was stuck in a couple of cases that I've been working with. And, and once I listened to the episode and then researched more into the different types of schemas, it became really clear what the client was struggling with. And once I had that framework, so in this specific example, it was an abandonment schema. And that's actually one you talk about quite a bit in the episode. So it's like, yes, I got some (laughs) tools with this, but it became really clear to say, oh, this is the schema that's showing up. And when it shows up for you, this is how you move away from your valued action. And how do you want to be acting in this relationship? And how can you notice the schema of abandonment showing up and then sort of acknowledge it and then take a step in the direction of your values? So we did a couple of the exercises that you recommended. I had them go through and um, look at the 10 different schemas and identify which was theirs. And then also work on identifying when the schema happens, what they feel, and then how they want to act that would be aligned with their values. It was really helpful. So I appreciated all the tips that you gave. And I think it'll be helpful for our listeners to listen for themselves, which schema kind of fits for them. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I think is great about this episode is that I think it's actually useful for clinicians, but also for all of us. All of us are in relationships. And for all of us, we bring our history into our current relationships and Sometimes it's really easy to see how somebody else is engaging in ways that are not helpful or or, or that are hurtful, but it's harder to see the own patterns and contributions that we bring to the table. And so one of the ways that I think this episode is really helpful is that it can help us to elucidate more clearly the ways that our own histories and our own internal narratives play out. Um, and she talks a lot about, you know, using this idea of schemas to be able to take off those glasses and see our own contributions more clearly. So, um, you know, whereas our narrative might be something like, I got angry because you hurt my feelings, or I lashed out because you were a bonehead, or I ignored you because you ignored me first, or I engaged in parenting that neither of us likes, but because you were far worse than I was. This um, combination of schema therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy really allows us to take a clearer look at our own st- our own contributions and to figure out how to be healthier and more um, in line with our own values. Yeah, I think that in acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, you can really take a look at this as a trap. You can get stuck in these types of thoughts. They can really make it so that you are not living the 
your values the way you want to be and you can get stuck there. And I definitely have clients where sometimes they're very fixated on like, this thing must change, this thing must change change. And that just gets them nowhere. It's really not helpful. And so to be able to take a step out of that and take a look at what's going on is really important. I think it's really helpful in relationships as well when we can understand our partner schema, because we can also, it also helps develop some compassion for our partner. So one of the schemas is unrelenting standards, right? And so if our partner has unrelenting high standards, that can, you know, if anyone would have that towards towards us, we'd want to like respond by rebelling against them or getting mad at them. But maybe if we could understand, oh, that's a schema that developed because of their early childhood experience of having a parent with higher high standards for them and how harmful that was that they had to develop that, you know, that schema as well. It helps us kind of soften in in response to a partner to understand where it's coming from. And I think that that's also a real key component in working with couples is seeing sort of the softer a more vulnerable emotion that's underneath some of the patterning. Absolutely. I, and I think another really common example that I see all the time in my clinical practice has to do with sexual intimacy. And it's often the case where one partner might feel objectified when their spouse initiates sex, whereas the other partner may feel rejected and unattractive when their partner turns down sex. And so in this very tangible way, our schemas are getting triggered in the sexual intimacy domain. And um, if you had to label the schemas, they might be uh, the subjugation schema and the defectiveness schema. So once you can identify them and sort of get to, as Diana was saying, the softer, more vulnerable side, then it becomes a lot more workable because now you can develop some compassion and some ways to sort of address it as opposed to just continuing on in this dynamic where you keep repeatedly triggering one another. And so that can provide a real um, strategy to working towards healing and also working towards, again, becoming more of the kind of partner that you'd like to be because you now have that awareness and appreciation of both your own and your partner's schemas. So let's hear from Dr. Abigail Lev about how we can learn to navigate difficulties in relationships with greater confidence, skill, and appreciation. Today, I'm excited to talk with clinical psychologist and author Abigail Lev. Dr. Abigail Lev, or Abby, specializes in integrating acceptance and commitment therapy with schema therapy to address interpersonal problems and unhelpful patterns in relationships. Dr. Lev is also the co-author of three books on acceptance and commitment therapy for interpersonal problems. Her titles include The Interpersonal Problems Workbook, Act to End Painful Relationship Patterns, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Interpersonal Problems Using Mindfulness, Acceptance, and Schema Awareness to Change Interpersonal Behaviors, and Acceptance and Commitment for Couples, a Clinician's Guide to Using Mindfulness, Values, and Schema Awareness to Rebuild Relationships. Abby's work offers valuable concepts and practices for individuals who have been struggling in their relationships, and I hope this episode gives listeners an opportunity to learn new strategies for how to heal their difficult relationships. So welcome, Abby. Thank you, Yael. I'm very happy to be here and excited to talk about relationships. Relationship. They're always hard. Every relationship has challenges. And I think that's often where I start in couples therapy is just sort of normalizing the experience. But that doesn't mean that we have to just sit in the pain. There are things and, and really helpful, wonderful strategies that you can use to um, make positive gains in relationships. And, and I'm so delighted that we get to take advantage of your expertise in that area. So you specialize in integrating acceptance and commitment therapy with schemas uh, and schema therapy. And I wonder if you might start us off by telling us a little bit about what, what schemas are. Schemas are core beliefs that we have developed about ourselves, usually in our early childhood. And these core beliefs, when they get triggered in our adult life, uh, they trigger this very old pain from childhood, uh, stories and narratives that we have about ourselves. So I use 10 particular schemas, um, abandonment, uh, emotional deprivation, entitlement, self-sacrifice, subjugation, unrelenting standards, perfectionism. Those are some examples of, of schemas. And these are uh, narratives that we've learned about ourselves in our early childhood due to our interactions 
with peers, our parents, we get these negative messages about ourselves and we start uh, identifying with these stories about ourselves. Uh, I think that would, uh, I think that everybody has an idea of schemas. We don't have to call them schemas. It's just a notion that we have about ourselves. So, for example, Pema Chodron, she speaks about schemas in the sense of propensity, that we have a certain propensity. And Esther Perel talks about schemas as a fundamental worldview, a particular pain point that we have, or emotionally focused couples therapy. Uh, their idea of schemas is <clears throat> those early attachment wounds. So I don't think we have to use the word schema, but basically helping people identify the pattern, the cycle that they keep bringing to all of their relationships that's related to their own worldview. Oh, I love that. Uh, I love that you're sort of um, expanding this idea of schemas to really understand that really a lot of relationship therapy approaches take the same idea in, in trying to identify what are the unhealthy patterns that we might regularly find ourselves in. And by understanding what we bring to the table in terms of how we engage in a relationship dynamic, we can better understand sort of what part we play. And, and, and then we're empowered to maybe do something differently. Absolutely. And, and I think that Esther Perel um, and also Pema Chodron, they really – uh, discuss how important it is to really label and identify that story and understand what we bring into all of our relationships. That it's it's an us, it's not in others. So schemas are like a pair of sunglasses that we've been shaped to wear. And we're wearing these shades and they color the way we see things and the way we perceive things. And the more aware we are of the sunglasses that we're wearing and how they're shaping the way we're filtering things and understanding things, the less influence it has on our behaviors. And when we're not aware of, of these lenses that we've developed through childhood, then it really impacts, it drives our behaviors and our interactions with others. Yeah, I, I think that awareness is, is so key. One of the things that I find when I'm doing couples therapy, and, and one thing that I find to be true is that when people come into the office, when they start off in couples therapy, they're often really focused on the way that their partner is behaving, or as the case may be, misbehaving in terms of how they're injuring um them and and sort of the inappropriate ways that they've identified. And I wonder, I'm, I'm curious more generally how you work with schemas, but also how you might help somebody become more aware. Because I do think that it's so common for us to be able to very clearly identify the way that our partner may be unhelpfully or unhealthily engaging in the relationship. But it's much, much harder for us to identify it for ourselves in terms of our own patterns or our own maladaptive habits. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, couples come into therapy and they have this idea that you know, if he is just kinder, then I'll be more uh, affectionate. If she is just less critical, then I'm going to be more reliable. And they, and, and that's why uh, part of the work with acceptance and commitment therapy with ACT is to help identify values and to really understand what values are because values are completely 100% within our control and are not contingent on other people and are not contingent on other people's behaviors. We have the same choice to move towards the kind of partner that we want to be if we want to be honest, reliable. Every moment is a choice that either brings us closer to that kind of partner that we want to be or further away from that person. And it's not contingent on other people. So one way to work with this is to really help people understand what their core primary pain is, which is what is their schema. For example, if you have an abandonment schema and you feel rejected and alone in relationships, what do you tend to do when you're triggered? And we all have certain coping mechanisms, coping behaviors that we've learned in early childhood to try to deal with that pain. The pain connected, the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations connected to that schema. <clears throat> And we have learned to do a certain behavior. Maybe if we have an abandonment schema, we might start pursuing our partner or clinging to our partner or uh, asking them, where have you been? Or maybe seeking reassurance. Do you still love me? And all of these coping behaviors that we've learned to do. 
uh, all lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy where we continue to confirm the very core belief that scares us. So if I have an abandonment scheme and I'm afraid of being left in relationships, pursuing and criticizing and uh, seeking excessive reassurance, these are all the things that are more likely to get me abandoned in a relationship or to have somebody pull away. So we see, so the way I work with schemas is really understanding and outlining the behaviors that you tend to, to, to do to try to avoid that pain. And notice that there's an alternative, that if we're willing to face that pain, we have freedom to do behaviors that are consistent with the deeply held values of what we want to be about. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love that message that is sort of consistent throughout act for a variety of different presenting problems because I think it's so empowering that regardless of how anybody else might respond to us, we can still work towards being the kind of person that we want to be. Now, I just want to say, I think that that is really, really hard in the context of relationships. So for example, if you have somebody who's really afraid of abandonment and they're partnered with somebody who may not be very warm or, or um, responsive and, and you're telling them, you know, we can empower you by uh, identifying your values and you working towards being, you know, your warm, kind, loving self, even in the context of being responded to by a partner who is, you know, on the face of it, kind of cool in, in the way that they take in those behaviors. And so how do you help people sort of continue to engage in ways that are value consistent, even in the face of not getting what it is that they want in response? Well, I think uh, what's interesting about schemas is there are different ways in which we can create them or maintain them. For example, we might find a relationship or a partner that is a very schema maintaining type of dynamic. So for example, if I have an abandonment schema and I continue to choose partners who, for example, have a subjugation schema, feeling controlled and engulfed in relationships, I'm continuing to find relationships that are schema maintaining. Uh, it's, it's like a schema chemistry attraction, right? Yeah. If somebody... You know, if somebody has a unrelenting standards of perfectionism schema, they continue to find somebody with a failure schema. Again, these are self-maintaining systems. Uh, another common one is having a defectiveness shame schema and being with someone who has an emotional deprivation schema. And the most common a pattern I see is between self-sacrifice and entitlement. So mm -hmm. these are... Uh, a maintaining system. But there's other ways that we can also maintain our core beliefs in relationships, even when we're not finding a partner that has our kind of opposite schemas. <clears throat> so if I have an abandonment schema, and I'm afraid of being rejected, I may not have, a, uh, I may not be with a partner who, who feels engulfed. But if I continue to do these old behaviors, I am, I'm pulling my partner to do the very behaviors that will lead to me, to, to me, to, to them withdrawing, right? So imagine if I have a mistrust schema and I feel, uh, I feel very mistrustful in relationships that I can't trust other people. I may be used or taken advantage of. If we think about this, this may have been a very adaptive story for me to build in my family of origin. If my family was not honest with me and they weren't reliable, they would say, I'm going to cook you dinner, and then dinner wasn't cooked. It was adaptive for me to create this story about myself and my environment and then do behaviors to take care of myself, such as uh, excessive autonomy and not believing them and becoming suspicious and doing things on my own. But now if I bring that to my adult relationships, mm -hmm. I'm creating a situation where those same needs in childhood are not going to get met in my relationships. And I could do that in two different ways. I could, I could continue to find people that are uh, not trustworthy. And if I find those people, it will confirm that, that pain, that familiar <laughs> uh, pain that I'm, uh, I'm used to. Or I could find somebody trustworthy, but then I do certain behaviors. I'm like, where have you been? What time was it? I become really suspicious or I behave uh, with excessive autonomy. I don't ask for help. I do my own thing. 
And so I never create conditions for that, for that belief to get disconfirmed in that relationship. And so, so oftentimes when we help clients do new behaviors, you're going to get information about, um, how much flexibility there is in that relationship? How much will your partner meet you where you need to be met versus um, whether you are in, in an intolerable situation and, and you are in a schema maintaining situation and then you come up with, you know, alternative solutions? Yeah. What I love about what you're saying is that um, you're sort of offering individuals the opportunity to sort of gather disconfirming evidence. And I think that's so important in the context of the schema work, because if you have this narrative that is so pervasive and so longstanding, um, we know from cognitive research that we have such a powerful tendency to confirm whatever it is that we already believe, right? You see that in politics, you see that in religion, you see that with morals, you certainly see that in relationships, right? If I think that if over time I've sort of come to see my partner as an unreliable person, I will pick up, I will sift in any information that confirms that he's unreliable and I will ignore or dismiss any information that disconfirms it. It's something that very automatically happens. I actually in graduate school did some research on information processing biases and, and they turn up all over the all over the place in ways that happen sort of outside of our conscious awareness. And I think that one of the powerful things that happens when you make people more aware of what their schemas are is they have an opportunity to really look at the, at the hard data and to actually actively look for opportunities to disconfirm. And so I think what you're saying is so important because if you do have some flexibility in the system and to work with your partner, it really behooves you to say, you know, I, I had this belief that my partner is kind of unreliable, but, but let me take a closer look at that. Let me sort of look for opportunities to allow them to, to provide disconfirming evidence. And, and maybe I'll find out that I'm not quite right. And maybe I'll find out that, you know, part of what I've been seeing in their behavior is really me projecting some of my beliefs or some of my fears and protecting myself. So it does require you to be aware of your schemas and also to um, make yourself a little bit vulnerable, right? Because you're actually ask, asking people to actively um, not protect themselves in these ways that allow their schemas to be maintained. I think that there's a very important distinction here that even though we are constantly helping people disconfirm their core beliefs, we're not, we're not actually doing that through challenging their beliefs or looking at their beliefs or arguing with their beliefs. Uh, we want them to do different behaviors and it's create more experiential. It's experiential. Exactly. And so when it comes to the triggers, the schema driven thoughts, feelings, sensations, the experience that shows up with their schemas, we're actually, through interventions, we're not challenging them or trying to fix or change any of these core experience. We're doing a lot of exercises, experiential exercises and act processes to help, help them build loving kindness and compassion and mindfulness with those feelings and thoughts. Uh, so it's not guiding and driving their behaviors. But ultimately, when we start doing behaviors that are aligned with our values, with the kind of partner that we want to be, we start seeing changes in our relationships. And changes in our relationships leads to you know, changes in how we think and feel about those relationships. And what's interesting, too, is that the more that you could understand how your schemas play out, you start noticing that this isn't about your partner, right? Those projections that we put on other people, we start noticing where it's in us. If I have a self-sacrifice schema, I easily feel guilty and I, I have a hard time making my own needs a priority and I take responsibility for other people's behaviors and thoughts and actions. I could notice that it's probably not just hard for me to say no to my partner. It's hard for me to say no to my partner. It's hard for me to say no to my friends. It's hard for me to say no to my boss. And if I could notice that these are behaviors that go across my relationships, I could see that there's ways in which not saying no or giving in or giving up, those kind of coping behaviors, those experiential avoidance strategies 
are what continues to create and maintain secondary pain in my relationships. I don't say no, I give up, I give in, I avoid conflict, and then later I end up feeling even more guilty, like I'm not important, then I feel resentful, then I feel angry, I feel like my relationships aren't fair, and it's easy to then start blaming my partner. You're not fair, you don't take care of me, you're selfish. But if we start noticing the way our behaviors are impacting that and the way that our thoughts and feelings are driving certain behaviors, then we have a lot of freedom. And we could notice that this experience, we are a part of co-creating that dynamic in multiple domains and getting the same outcomes. Right, right. Yeah, it is, it's so empowering, which on the, on the one hand is so cool, and on the one hand is so scary for most people, right? Because if you're responsible for some of the yucky stuff that ends up happening, then it's really on your shoulders, which can be overwhelming and, and really a vulnerable place to be. So I'm kind of curious. I'm, I wonder if you could walk us through some of the exercises that you might give uh, an individual or a couple in session and, and what kinds of things do you have them practice at home in terms of uh, you know getting behavioral practice, having those kinds of experiences. And then also I'm particularly interested in the kinds of exercises that you might give to individuals in terms of managing the kind of schema pain that would come up when they're trying new be- kinds of behaviors and and sort of leaning into that? Well, um, I'll start with the idea uh, you mentioned about couples coming in and trying to get their partner to change. Mm-hmm. So, Good place to start. That's uh, that's yeah, like that, the common experience. And, and honestly, I, I can understand that from a personal perspective. And I think most of us can. Like when I get into a fight with my partner, what I see is what they did wrong, right? And I think that's just so normal. So I, I just want to kind of point out normal that, it, you know, we might see the the log in our partner's eyes instead of the speck of dust in our own. <laughs> that's a good metaphor, yeah. Uh, so one, one thing I could have them do is clarify their values and write down a list of all of their values, honesty, consistency, affection, kindness, assertiveness. I'll have them write a list of their own values and then I'll rate the importance, rate how important are these values to you and then rate from zero to a hundred how consistent have your behaviors been with those values this week and then on the other side write from zero to a hundred how consistent have your partner's behaviors been this week. And then what I want them to take a look at is noticing that Let's say they've been compassionate at a 40% and their partner's been compassionate at a 30%. They've been kind at a 20% and their partner has been kind at a 20 or 30% or they've been assertive at a 10 and their partner has been assertive at a 30. To kind of notice that you could either choose to focus on your partner and getting that line, right, that to change or you could start first focusing on you and getting yourself close as close to those values as possible. And then when you're at 80s or 90s on your column and just focus on your column and look at what's important and start focusing on changing your behaviors. And once you're there at 80s or 90s, then you could just notice what happens in the relationship and where your partner ends up. Maybe your partner changes. Maybe when you're more compassionate, they're more loving. Maybe when you're more assertive, they're more considerate. Or maybe the par- maybe your partner doesn't change. And wouldn't that be interesting information to pay attention to, to just notice rather than trying to get them to change and control them? Wouldn't it be interesting to just kind of watch what happens when you behave as you truly want to be? And this uh, exercise, there's lots of different fun things that you can do with it because um, because people with different schemas tend to have different propensities. So for example, somebody with an unrelenting standards schema, with a perfectionism schema, um, they want their partner to be perfect on everything, right? And with them, I help them distinguish a little bit and look at what values are important and help them identify what is your ideal situation, uh, what is an acceptable, tolerable situation, and what is intolerable. And notice that if you're not falling into an intolerable situation, or if your most important values, if the ones that you rated at a 10 are really working out, 
to notice what, how do you behave and what do you respond around the ones that are important and at eight and your partner's doing them at like an 80 and you're still dissatisfied, right? As opposed to other people who tolerate a lot of intolerable things, right? Yeah. And helping them really notice um, the situations where you are in an intolerable situation. How do we help you distinguish between your underlying needs and your wants? So our underlying needs are a non-negotiable, whereas our wants have to be very flexible. There should be many, many ways to meet an underlying need. For example, if I have an underlying need for affection, um, it would really help if I could be flexible about making a request for affection, such as, would you be willing to hold my hand? Would you be willing to give me a kiss? Would you be willing to give me a hug? If my partner's not willing to do that, would you be willing to cuddle? And the thing is, is that the more I'm flexible about the way I want to get the need met, uh, the more likely I could be to get that underlying need met. And there are certain things that may not be negotiable, like a need for honesty. And there are other things that might be a little bit more negotiable. Uh, and the more flexible we are about the wants, the more we could hold on to having our needs be putting ourselves in a situation where we could have a win-win rather than a society teaches us that we have more of a, a zero-sum game <laughs> regarding right, couples and their, their needs. And I see that playing out a lot in, in, in these common patterns of seeing schemas of subjugation, right, feeling controlled and self-sacrificing and entitlement and seeing how, how difficult it is for us to negotiate our needs. So there are certain schemas that tend to go certain directions in relation to needs, right? Entitlement or, or unrelenting standards, they want their ideal, and it's hard for them to notice the difference between their ideal and what's intolerable. Whereas people with a subjugation schema or self-sacrifice schema, it's hard for them to notice the difference between what's intolerable and tolerable. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think that's where psychological flexibility fits in so well, because I think that sort of by their nature, schemas tend to be quite rigid. Um, and so whether you're talking about subjugation or perfection, uh, the goal might really be to build in some flexibility around how you respond or how you even process the information that's coming in from the surrounding environment from your partner um, around you know, behaviors, interactions. One thing that I was thinking too as you were talking is that, you know, if you're encouraging people to sort of be aware of what their fundamental desires are, what their sort of non-negotiables are, like I might want to experience love and the way that I experience love is through affection. That's sort of what fills my cup and I, you have a lot of couples. I see a lot of couples where like one is, um, it's sort of like the love languages idea. One experiences love in a more fulfilling way through physical affection. The other might experience it more through verbal affirmation. And so if you can identify what the need is, which is really to feel love, and you can also identify the way that I feel loved is through physical affection, but I can recognize that my partner may have differences and sort of come at it from an accepting and compassionate perspective. And then as you are talking about, like build in some flexibility, right? They may feel more comfortable delivering love through verbal affirmation, which doesn't quite work for me. But if I can appreciate that and accept it, and I'm willing to sort of give positive feedback and, and be clear and kind, which might be consistent with my values about what it is that would really work well for me, would that help us to build a system that operated in a more fulfilling way? And so it's sort of, you're working on your schemas, you're working with acceptance, you're working with clear communication, and you're working within the context of your values. And all of those kinds of things are a lot more effective to getting more of what works better for you imperfectly, right? And so you're tolerating... Um, imperfection and you're tolerating some of the differences that exist between you and your partner and you're tolerating, um, you know, not getting all of your needs perfectly met or maybe quite far from that. But yeah. you're sort of deciding to, to that in the toleration, the system moves in a better direction. Right. 
And you could notice that if two people, it's very hard for two people to negotiate their both their ideal situations all the time. So if your ideal is like a hundred, right? How can we negotiate something that gets you close enough to your ideal and you're not in an intolerable situation, but both of you are in like a good enough situation. Whereas we see problems arise when one partner continues to fall into an intolerable situation and another partner continues to get their ideal situation. So I think uh, helping client, helping couples and clients negotiate in ways that describe their underlying needs that really validate the core pain and that helps them see things in win-win scenarios rather than if I win, you lose, and if you lose, I win, to notice that it's hard <laughs> to be to get always get your ideal. But it doesn't mean that somebody has to be in an intolerable situation. That doesn't have to happen. Yeah. And yeah. I think uh, when you speak about the tolerating, uh, that is a very important piece in the treatment is helping partners really understand what is the part of their own schemas and their conditioning that is unavoidable, that will be there in all relationships. We all feel moments of being rejected, of being alone, of being deprived. There's certain just experiences that show up in relationships, especially from our own propensities that continue to show up. And the important question is, what do you want to be about when that shows up? Yeah. What kind of person and partner do you want to stand for when this pain, this familiar pain shows up for you in relationships? Yeah. Yeah. I often think of myself as like the myth buster in couples therapy, <laughs> like reminding people or, or just telling them even for the first time that, you know, pain is a part of any intimate relationship. It's unavoidable. And that what separates couples that do well from couples that really struggle is that those that do well figure out how to use that pain to get to a different place, how to work together through it, how to make it a team project. And like you were saying, it's kind of like if one person wins, then both really lose. You have to sort of figure out a way for um, that the couple can get together as a team versus the problem and that it may not ultimately be either of their perfect outcomes, but if they're in it together and sort of helping each other try to meet whatever fundamental needs exist, then, then really they both win even if, the, even if neither of them gets their ideal. And I think that that's so important. I am kind of curious. Um, well, I had a couple uh, Two questions. So one is that um, I'm curious if you have any specific strategies that our listeners might be able to practice um, that relate to tolerating schema pain, right? So this idea that, for example, you know, if I um, worry about being abandoned and I'm and I am taking your advice and trying to practice engaging in leaning into that schema pain and, and sort of allowing my partner to disconfirm. So not sort of avoiding them or avoiding uh, in, talking with them when that schema gets triggered. What are ways that you suggest that people handle that deep pain that might come up when, when that deep fear arises? I encourage my clients to really uh, move in towards the pain especially using emotion exposure in the sense that if, if somebody is afraid of a spider, we might take tiny little baby steps to bring that spider closer. We might talk about the spider or take pictures of spiders, look at pictures, look at movies. But at some point we would want in the very small steps to have that spider kind of sitting on our hand and notice that it's not so bad. And, and that is the same thing that I want to help my clients do with their schema driven feelings and sensations. Those are always going to continue to show up. They're with you. They're unavoidable. And how do we want to relate to them? Do we want to relate to them like they're the enemy or do we want to relate to them a little bit more like a crying baby? And when the crying baby is kind of screaming over here in your ear and you're holding this baby, you're not going to push that baby away. You're not going to go shut up. <laughs> you're in so much pain. Why are you in this pain? What is your problem? What do you need? Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You're going to kind of bring that baby closer. And even though that noise gets louder, you're still going to bring that baby closer with a lot of gent gentle, 
kindness, compassion, and you're going to say things like, it makes sense that you're feeling like this. This is so hard. This is so scary. Of course you feel like this. How tough this is. With just a lot of kindness and embracing that experience and really the number one thing I say is it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense that I feel this way. It makes sense that you're feeling this way. And really um, building a willingness to have all of the experience that, that shows up and, and, and a softness to it. And one way that I think really helps us do that is when we can really connect that pain to certain values. For example, if I have a self-sacrifice schema, if I'm not willing to have guilt, I'm not able to be assertive in relationships. It's a barrier. So it's always a question when I, when I help clients move towards this, this pain, it's A, about recognizing that everything they've done hasn't, hasn't worked in getting rid of that pain. And B, moving and running and avoiding that pain stops them from doing important things in their relationships. My guilt stops me from asserting myself or saying no or creating fairness. Uh, let's say my defectiveness shame might stop me from being honest and vulnerable uh, and expose myself. Um, my mistrust abuse may stop me from hearing you and being curious and flexible. And when we could really connect that avoidance with who they want to be and what they want to stand for, it acts as a motivator to help them be more willing to have this pain. And I will ask them, where in your body do you feel this pain most intensely right now? And maybe we could take your hand and put your hand on that place and breathe into it and soften up to it, and like a little crying baby, <laughs> right, massage it a little bit, and really open up and make a little bit more space. And with couples, it's not just about making more space for your pain, but you also have to make more space for your partner's pain. Because then we also want to get rid of our partner's pain so that we don't feel that pain. Mm -hmm. If they feel defective or ashamed, we go, no, don't worry, you'll get better. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. You're, you're, you're great. And you do this well, right? Whereas really, we don't need as much reassurance as we do validation, as we do somebody just sitting and witnessing and having our pain with us. Again, like the crying baby. And reassurance could also function as avoidance. Yeah. And I might want my partner, don't be upset and don't be sad. And it's all again to control my schemas, my pain. And so building an openness and a softness to our own experience, noticing how intense it is, getting really curious about what that feels like, and then also providing that same experience for our partner. It makes sense that that hurt you. Um, maybe I didn't mean to do that, and I don't get it completely, but given your history, your origins, your schemas, and your experiences, it makes sense that that felt hurtful, or you felt rejected, or you felt alone. That makes sense. Yeah, I think there's What's, what's so powerful in the therapy room is something that can, in theory at least, be translated into our relationships, which is this experience of getting validation, of having somebody who's not only curious, but kind of gets why it is that you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And I think so often with our partners, and often it's because we love them so much, we don't want them to feel bad. We want to fix it. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but somehow in the process of trying to fix their bad feeling, we end up invalidating them and sort of creating this division between us and our partner. And I think exactly what you're saying is sort of a different approach. It's an approach that suggests it's okay for you to feel bad. It's okay for your partner to feel bad. And that the, the response that's less useful is to try to fix it, to try to eliminate that bad feeling. Instead, a more useful response might be to say, okay, I feel that way, or okay, my partner feels that way. It makes sense. It is okay. And if we can join with our partner and sort of uh, physically or abstractly hold their hand in it and just kind of be there and understand and be curious about what that experience is like and they can do that for us, it doesn't undo the bad feeling, but it makes us feel less alone in it, which is a very healing experience and really something that we offer in the therapy room, but again, that people can really take into their relationships, that that um, approach of just validating and, and bearing witness and, and being interested in understanding what, the, what your experience and what your partner's experience is like. Absolutely. 
because the idea here is not just that my primary pain, my schemas are unavoidable and they will get triggered in my relationships, but the schemas that my partner brings into our relationship are also unavoidable. And how can we just notice when they get triggered without taking responsibility for it, trying to fix it, make it different, avoid it? How can we just notice that and really validate and stay with it and notice that regardless how much pain we're in in the moment, we have the same choice to do behaviorally what we want to be about. Uh, Even if I'm angry, I have the same choice to stay curious, to stay flexible and assertive, that no matter what. Uh, the ways that our thoughts and our feelings are pulling us to kind of engage in these old behaviors that fool us into thinking that we could avoid certain pain temporarily, that ultimately we have the same choice in that moment with all of those schema-driven thoughts and feelings to do the behaviors that bring us closer to who we want to be and what we want to be about. Absolutely. One of the things that... um I am thinking about as you're talking is this wonderful worksheet. I'm I'm trying to find it as we're talking that you had um, that people can download along with, uh, I think it's your most recent book and we'll link to all your books on our website. Um, But you talk about the, I think it's something like 10 different relationship domains and in the worksheet, I think you have couples or individuals. Oh, here it is. Uh, no, that's not it. Um, you have individuals identify their values in each of the different relationship domains. So I just wanted to give you a, a moment to talk about that because I thought that was so cool that it's not like you have, um, you know, my relationship, I want to be honest. You actually separate it out into like communication, sex, parenting, money, affection, work, conflict, decision-making or negotiation, friendship and extended family, and then shared activities. And I think it can be useful to sort of identify in each of the relationship domains, as as you have couples do through your um, worksheet, what are their top values, you know, in, for example, sex, you know, what, what are the most important ways that you uh, want to be in your sexual relationship with your partner? And, and that'll look different than the top important ways that you'd like to be uh, when you're having a conflict with your partner. I, the more specific we could be about the situation, uh, the more likely we could make a behavioral change. So if I could really think about what do I want to be when I'm angry, plus what do I want to be when my mind is telling me that it's my partner's fault, plus what do I want to be about when my heart is racing really fast, when we could connect all of those things, we're, we're more likely to do a different behavior. Uh, you know, anger is something, when I think about anger, my values are about being curious and being flexible and being assertive. And Often when we look at these different relationship domains, sometimes they could look radically different or sometimes they could look very similar. And I am a very firm believer that values rarely conflict. And if we find a conflict within our values, it's usually related to these different domains or around having the time for these domains. So for example, if I wanna be both compassionate and assertive and firm and loving, I, there, I could come up with a behavior. So I believe in win-win strategies with needs. And I also believe that values rarely conflict. We could win-win, find a behavior that's always consistent with a set of values that may feel rather oppositional. They, they usually aren't. But we might have a bit of a conflict in one of these domains. So uh, especially, for example, work-life balance, right? Like the time that I want to spend at home versus uh, at work. So there's these conflicts that show up, but ultimately we could always come up with a very specific behavior that will be consistent with a lot of different values and brings us uniquely towards a set of those values. Yeah, I love that. And I I, I was just sort of thinking that it might be lovely for our listeners to have some take-home messages. So whether or not you're in a conflicted relationship. I think that a lot of the things that you've talked about today can help us all to develop happier and healthier relationships. So if you're starting from a good place, you can still build further um, in the positive direction. And if you're 
you know, stuck in an unhealthy relationship, there are lots and lots of different ways that you can build towards a happier, healthier place. And so, um, you know, I, I think that you've talked about so many things and I don't know sort of for you, what are the most important take homes, but I'll say that one of the things that I think you kept coming back to that I think is just so important is to really reflect and clarify with yourself, what kind of a partner do you want to be? Who do you want to be sort of aside and sort of outside of, uh, how particular your partner might respond to you, what is it that you want to stand for? Um, so I don't know if you have any other thoughts on you know how people can build towards those happier, healthier relationships. Um, what do you think the main take-home message is that a listener might have? I'll say a couple of things off of the top of my head. I would say that we all have stories about ourselves. We all have schemas, whatever we want to call them, attachment wounds, propensities, schemas, worldviews, whatever we want to call it. We all have this. We all have our conditioning, and that conditioning is not true. We don't equal that conditioning. That conditioning is, is nothing to do with us, uh, but it's, and it's not our fault, but it's our responsibility. We have to then notice this conditioning and then notice that all of the thoughts, feelings, sensations, and experiences that show up are internal experiences related to that conditioning does not control our behavior. Something else is in control of our behavior. We could stand for something and not be pulled in an automatic way, uh, just get pulled, basically uh, live driven by fear and avoidance. We could choose to live uh, based on avoiding, avoiding pain and fear, or we could live about going towards something, something that matters and being intentional. And when we do that, when we continue to be intentional and go towards what matters, we're always moving towards a better relationship, whether we're this person or the next person, we're always moving towards that regardless of what happens, regardless of the outcome within our current relationship. We are moving ourselves in that direction because it is a hundred percent in our control. I have a hundred. It's always in my control to be and stand for what matters to me the most. I love that. That's beautiful. Uh, also, I guess I would say, you know, some tips around the fact that, um, you know, also like this pain is unavoidable validation. How can I stay really validating myself and validating my partner? I'm not responsible for their thoughts, feelings, and, and responses. I'm not at fault for that. But how can we stay with this experience? How can we just make space for right everybody's kind of primary pain without trying to do something about it? And also notice that we could still stand for what we want to be about. And then uh, I guess lastly, I would just say that there's a lot of skills that I really think are helpful for couples, especially nonviolent communication. And I'm sorry, I don't mean couples. I mean every human being. Yeah, that's right. Violent communication should, I think, be taught, you know, in kindergarten classes. That's right. Um, that's right. So I think that there is a way where we can not be in lose-lose dynamics or not avoid conflict to be more willing to uh, discuss and be within the relationship, the impact that you have on me and the impact that I have on you without getting really triggered or needing something to be different. So really validating and understanding our underlying feelings. And when those feelings um, aren't feeling good, that there's underlying needs that aren't being met. I guess I would say to people, our compass of how we're feeling, it works. It isn't broken. So we don't want to avoid that pain. <laughs> we want to really listen to it because it's guiding us about what, what matters, what's working, what isn't working, what we need more of, what we need less of. It's an important compass. And lately, we've all wanted to get rid of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We have a message in our culture that if you're having an intense emotional experience, then you need to find a way to eliminate it. <laughs> and and what? that and and really that our emotions are informative. That's what our system was built to do. We use our, our emotions are useful as as a compass, as information, and they don't need to direct our behaviors, but they can help us make good choices. And sometimes they're more and sometimes they're less helpful, but unless we pay attention, it's hard even to distinguish between when they're helpful or not. Exactly. And I think that if we think about act using the sky metaphor, if we could just watch all of the different weather, 
in, in, in our experience, that weather will change. If we could notice the storm and notice the sun and notice when it's raining and notice when it's snowing, uh, the more that we struggle with the weather, uh, the more stuck we get and the longer that weather lasts. And the more curious we get about it, the more we could stay with it, the more we could use it as information and notice that we don't equal that weather. We have choices around that weather. We could put boots on and we could bring an umbrella or we could stay home and isolate. But we, we, we can't change our weather, but it doesn't have to be our enemy. Our partner's weather, our weather, it doesn't have to be our enemy. It could be something that we can really hold and have and um, build lots of love and compassion with and let it guide us a little bit and soften up to it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Abigail. This was such a wonderful conversation, and I hope that you all learned some valuable ideas about relationships, about our emotional well-being, and about strategies to interact um, more helpfully with ourselves and with our partners. Um, We'll link to your wonderful books on our website and to your uh, private practice website. Um, Is there any other places that people can find out more information about you and your wonderful work? Yes. um, If people want to take a questionnaire that will test their core beliefs, I do have a questionnaire on my website, which is www.bayareacbtcenter.com. So it's Bay Area CBT, like Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Center.com. And if you go to the resources, you could take a questionnaire and it will tell you whether you have an abandonment schema or entitlement or emotional deprivation and get some fun um, uh, feedback on that. Great. Yes. We'll definitely link to that through our website as well to make it easier for people who didn't have a pen handy. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. We really appreciate it. It was an honor speaking with you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Abigail. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. Music by John Gu and Susie Stevens, and special thanks to our creative producer, Dr. Meg McKelvey. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you are looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our website. Our website is offtheclockpsych.com. That's offtheclockpsych.com.